Hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome. Wow, it's great to have a full house here in the Nightingale Sky Room. Uh, thank you all so much for coming on what will be the last weekend of the Ann Brigman and Laid Bear in the Landscape exhibitions. It's amazing that there's only three days left, so what a great way to finish things off. My name is Ann Wolf, and I am the Andrea and John C. Dean Family Senior Curator and Deputy Director here at the museum, and also the curator of the Ann Brigman and Laid Bear in the Landscape exhibitions. Um, the companion, oh, thank you. And of course, it's in the Laid Bear in the Landscape exhibition that Judy's work is featured. Um, so tonight's conversation between Judy Chicago and Philippe Kaiser is part of the Deborah and Dennis Scholl Distinguished Speaker Series. And I just want to mention that just a couple of days ago, down on our second floor, we opened a major exhibition um, called The Inside World, Contemporary Aboriginal Australian Memorial Poles from the collection of these amazing Miami-based collectors. And much of that work and many of the other Aboriginal works uh, will be coming uh, to our permanent collection as a promised gift of them. So it's incredible. If you haven't seen it, please make sure to do that. So tonight we are here to enjoy a conversation between Judy Chicago and Philippe Kaiser, who will be discussing, among many other things, I'm sure, uh, Judy's outdoor performance works from the 1970s that were made in response to the emergence of land art in the American West around the same time. So for those of you who don't know, Nevada is often considered the birthplace of land art in the American West. And when the international art world thinks of Nevada, it's often to recognize the work of two 20th century land artists, Michael Heiser and Walter Di Maria. Between the two of them, Nevada claims 15 significant land art interventions since 1968. And of course, many, many artists have followed in their footsteps, including the Swiss artist Ugo Rondinone, with whom we co-produced and presented Seven Magic Mountains outside of Las Vegas just a couple of years ago. And then in, 20, in 2020, we will organize the first major exhibition of large-scale photographs by the Italian photographer Gianfranco Gorgoni, who was the image maker on the ground alongside Michael Heiser and Walter Di Maria and Robert Smithson and many others while they were creating uh, their desert artworks. So I guess you could say that land art is in our art historical DNA here in Nevada even as, as we grapple with the fact that the genre is often critiqued as environmentally destructive and overly masculine. In fact, the writer Jeffrey Kastner um, summarized what many critics were thinking when he wrote, the early land art movement was arguably the most macho of the post-war art, post art eras. In its first manifestations, the genre was one of diesel and dust, populated by hard hat minded men, finding their identities away from the comforts of the cultural center, digging holes and blasting cuts through cliff sides, recasting the land with masculine disregard for the longer term. These conversations, debates and dialogues are at the very heart of what we do here at our Center for Art and Environment, the research arm of the museum that is home to an extensive archive collection and library the center houses materials in excess of one million items uh, from more than 1,000 artists working on all seven continents. And among these items are seminal materials related to the evolution of early earthworks um, up, to the present, up to present day land and um, socially engaged practices. And Bill Fox, who's the director of the center, is here with us tonight. Thank you so much, Bill. So tonight, we'll begin with a short presentation uh, by Philippe Kaiser, uh, who's going to provide some context for the discussion he'll then have with Judy Chicago in relation to land art. And that'll be followed by a conversation between the two of them. And if we have time, some uh, Q&A uh, following that. So I'd like to bring Philippe up. I'll introduce him. Philippe is an independent curator and critic based in Los Angeles. He is the former senior curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles where he curated Ends of the Earth, Land Art to 1974. And he's the former director of the Museum Ludwig in Cologne, Germany. And he organized the Swiss Pavilion at the 2017 Venice Biennale. Please join me in welcoming Philippe. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, I'm very excited to be here, and um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the exhibition. I brought the exhibition catalog for those of you who have never seen the catalog. 
And I was so happy because I brought it all the way from LA. It was called Ends of the Earth, Land Art to 1974. It was an exhibition that took place at LA MOCA in 2012, so it's a while ago. I co-curated the show together with UCLA scholar uh, Miwon Kwon, and he traveled to Munich to house their Kunst. And I've always known, it's my first time in Reno, but I, I'm very excited because I've known about uh, the activities of the museum. I know about, Bill Fo I met Bill Fox a while ago. I know about the amazing archives here. And so what I'm saying in the next 10 minutes is not about undermining what you're doing here because I also want to expand. Or what Mibon and I did with this show in Los Angeles, it was a pretty big show. For those of you who have been there, it was at the Geffen in this big warehouse. And we recreated a lot of pieces. And uh, we tried to be very inclusive and to give like a revisionist view of the entire movement. <clears throat> so the problem starts with the title. The question is earthworks versus land art. In the US, everyone talks about earthworks, which, um, and I will talk about that in a second, goes back to a title of an exhibition. But earthworks is kind of misleading from my European Swiss slash German perspective because I think it always talks about or it features monumental work, it features sculptural works. And I think what Miwon and I were interested in when we did this show um, was looking at all the loose ends that kind of lead to these monumental works. And there's much more than you think there is. Um, so we all know Michael Heiser. And I think one of the reasons as great as the Dia Art Foundation that you might know is, but the Dia Art Foundation started in 1974, and for us that was also the cutting off of the land art show, because that's the start of the institutionalization, uh, the institutionalization of land art, the big project. This was earlier, 69, we all know that. I, I don't want to talk about uh, Michael Heiser, and, and, and um, it was interesting that the two artists you just mentioned, Michael Heiser, Walter and Maria, uh, I'm, I've seen Michael multiple times, but they were both reluctant to be in the exhibition. But it wasn't the first show. I mean, they weren't in the major land art shows. They weren't part of that. They also pulled out in the last moment, and that's what they did for in our show, because their practice is grand, and their practice is about themselves. So <laughs> as great as it is. <laughs> It's either me or the Wizard of Oz who kind of lifts the <laughs> curtain. But what's interesting about, and I don't want to talk about that because I know that you focus at the museum on these activities and, and as much as I'm influenced by Robert Smithson's writings and all that, and he was extremely interesting. But what I'm saying is the 1974 cutting off uh, moments of, for Dia, you know, when Dia started and also some other initiatives start, for example, in Buffalo where big pieces got commissioned, we felt this is the moment when the big, uh, like for example, Walter Maria's lightning field starts, you know, where the artists go bigger and bigger and bigger, James Turrell uh, and so on, Nancy Holt, 1977. I mean, they're amazing pieces. But we felt it's also interesting, Dia kind of promoted this view of land art as monumental works. And we, we have to see Dia initially started as a gallery program. There was a German gallerist from Munich and whose name was Heine Friedrich and he promoted the artist and that's how it started and how people got an idea about land art slash earth, earthworks. So here's another monumental work. And what we, what we found is interesting is, is, and we talked to Nancy Holt and Nancy Holt said, oh, you're interested in the loose ends before the big explosion. And I think that's how you can describe it. And what we found is, you know, there are three canonical events for the movement. It's kind of a non-movement movement. But this is the exhibition I just mentioned. It was called Earthworks at Vaughan Gallery in an apartment in New York at the gallery uh, with carpet. You see um, Robert Morris, Carl Andre, uh, Robert Smithson, uh, who was the curator together with Virginia Dwan to do this show. And I think this is, you know, we, me one and I had to face this, these, um, the myth of land art. People would say, so what are you gonna show? Land art, it's out there, you can't show anything. And we said, well, actually the first exhibition was in a gallery that was called Earthworks. And the artists were thinking about, you know, the relation between here and there, site and non-site. Robert Smith talked about that in many texts. 
Um, so here's, this is another canonical event. There were three that we also featured in the exhibition. 1969, the fabulous Earth Art Exhibition at Cornell University in Ithaca, curated by Willoughby Sharp. He invited all male artists sitting there uh, on a bench, all amazing artists who did like uh, work in the museum. That was the old museum that closed afterwards. And uh, this is a, a long, Richard Long piece. And many of the artists, also Robert Smithson, for example, he, for the first time ever, he would do like a piece that's out there. Like half of it was in the museum, half of it was out there. It was all relational. 1969, the same year, um, there was this German filmer, Gary Schum, who, who he didn't coin the term land art. He wanted to call it landscape art. It was actually, supposedly it's Walter de Maria, who was the first person who talked about land art. And we felt land art is much more inclusive because it talks about artists who engage with the land, politically, performative, in many, many different ways, and not in a sculptural way or monumental way. What's really interesting about Gary Schum, he, made, he commissioned these short films with Dennis Oppenheim, Botsam, Richard Long, um, Michael Heiser, uh, Walter de Maria, Heiser, I think Walter de Maria, he pulled it out in the very end, and it wasn't, it was on the poster, but not in the film. And at that time, in post-war German television, they would screen these films, um, maybe at 10 at night, and you could see them. What's interesting about it is a big audience in Europe heard about land art and what was going on here in the Southwest, because uh, the land art films were shown in uh, the famous exhibition When Attitudes Become Form, and it traveled all over Europe. So it was very, that was kind of the mediator of land art. So I already addressed one of the myth, you know, what can you exhibit? And the, the work is out there, and I think it's really interesting, and we wrote about that in a catalog, that land art is to a certain degree um, linked to media culture, to pop art. You know, it has to be mediated. In the orchid, a critic said at that time, the orchid in the jungle doesn't go unseen. You know, you have to hear about it, either through a rumor, you have to see a photograph, it has to be mediated. And it's different than nowadays with Instagram and, and all that stuff, but, but, but it was, it was um, interesting how the artists conceptualized the communication and distribution of the works. This is a famous Jan Dibbets piece. So myth number two is that land art was something that only took place in the southwest of the US. Uh, there are some European artists. Also, you know, when you talk about this, the Holy Trinity of Walter and Maria Heiser Smithson, they're all fabulous artists, and I'm not, I'm not saying they're not great, but it's interesting that artists that engage with the land where, for example, Jean Tangeli, he did in 1962, outside of Las Vegas, study for an end of the world. And many artists at the time, in the early 60s, were addressing all the atomic bomb tests in the desert, and you might know about that, of course. Um, Jean Tangeli, for example, who's a Swiss artist, who happened to have Virginia Dwan, the gallerist, and he came out to Los Angeles all the time and would do something on site. It was like a media spectacle. There's also a film, he was on the news, and so on. I think for, you know, you ask yourself as an art historian, why did this happen at that time? And I think many of the pieces uh, that deal with the land in the 60s and the early 70s um, were kind of initiated and triggered by um, uh, mili the, 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 also here in the Southwest by the militarization, yeah. by the urbanization, and also by war, you know, because this is a picture of Hiroshima and Cologne on the bottom. And it's interesting when you talk about where did the land art pieces happen, we found a lot of artists that engaged with the landscape in the US, but also in Japan, in Germany, and in, in these kind of countries, you know, that were highly affected by uh, reconstruction, building freeways, building infrastructure, and uh, also in, Iceland, surprisingly, there, were, there was like a group of ar artists who dealt with uh, land issues. There's another artist, Heinz Mack, for example, who did, he was a kind of a late modernist artist who dealt uh, with light, but he did all these experiments in the early 60s. This is from 68, but he did it earlier on in the Sahara. And there were like similar things going on. You know, the, the French would do like atomic bomb tests 
in the desert in the Sahara in North Africa. And so he went there and he did all these pieces. And of course, it was very different from like the minimalist rhetorics that Heiser and Walter de Maria had. But it's interesting to notice that there was other things going on. And I think at that time when he did that, he didn't know about, there were these magazines, Avalanche, but he didn't know about what was going on here. It was like a zeitgeist thing that was what's going on in multiple places. On the left side, you see Klaus Oldenburg digging a, digging a hole in Central Park on the right side in the 60s in, in Japan, a group, Group E. It was more like a happening. They were digging a hole and then covering the hole afterwards. It was kind of communal labor uh, to experience devastation, bomb drops, and to address all that. They were, I'm just showing like a few things. In Israel, that's another place I haven't mentioned yet, there was a group of conceptual artists dealing with the land, dealing with territory, politics, digging like a hole on the Palestinian side, digging another hole on the Israel side and exchange the earth. And they did projects not knowing about what was going on because they worked in the kibbutz and they didn't really know what was going on here in the US. And I thought it's remarkable that you know, similar things were going on, but you couldn't really tell, it was a different intention and a different agenda, of course. Another artist, and is of course Judy Chicago, I found out about this amazing uh, group of works, Atmosphere, that she started, she did 14 of them between 1968 and 1974. And uh, we will talk about it afterwards, and we featured her work in there too. This is like one performance um, with Face Wilding, and we will talk about that later. But I've also felt performative practice, early feminism is crucial to you know how artists started to deal with the land and getting engaged in a different way than the artists we usually know or usually talk about. These are just some exhibition um, you know, photographs. You see Yves Klein. Yves Klein also, he, he wrote some proposals about pouring concrete in the valleys of the, of the world on the planet. And uh, you can say the exhibition also doesn't have a starting date because we can't really say when does it start, but it starts in the late 50s that people start to engage with the planet in multiple ways. Fluxes, there are many Fluxes artists that deal with, with land art, and I think this is like a part or a string or a loose end that has never been acknowledged. That some artists, you know, are, uh, George Brecht, for example, was cutting landscapes and moving continents conceptually, or they're doing, or uh, Alan Capro is in there. <coughs> Richard Long, we kind of recreated a few works. Here you see the Robert Morris piece that was in the Virginia Dwan show that he recreated for our exhibition. Uh, Newton Harrison, the Harrisons, a piece we recreated. And then it was also a gallery um, with a younger generation of female artists who were like the, Alice Aycock who was a student of Robert Morris and started in the early, six, uh, early 70s with this dirt floor. Alice Aycock, Mary Miss, uh, you know, um, Anna Mendieta, of course, is in the show that you can see in the gallery. I mean, there are many artists. We kind of open it up. And, uh, and it's interesting to see that the feminist discourse doesn't, um, or meets the land art discourse in the early 70s and not in the late 70s. And that's what most people think, you know, that this comes later. But it was actually, and Judy Chicago's atmosphere pieces are super early when you look at everything else. Um, yeah, and then the show traveled to Munich, and I was very happy to have it. I found this photograph in my archive, and we put Judy Chicago on there, and that was a surprise, but I think um, it's amazing, and let's talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Philippe, for setting the stage for this next part of our evening. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce to you Judy Chicago tonight. Judy is an artist, an educator, an author, and a humanist whose work and life are models for an enlarged definition of art, an expanded role for the artist, and women's rights to freedom of expression. Her most well-known and widely acclaimed work, of course, is The Dinner Party, which is the centerpiece of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. And um, as Philippe just mentioned, in the late 60s and 70s, 
Judy undertook a series <clears throat> of outdoor performance works called Atmospheres uh, with the goal of the pyrotechnic performances uh, to feminize the environment and reclaim the landscape for women. And in 2012, she began working again with these with ephemeral materials such as dry ice and fireworks. Um, and I'll just mention that um, the film you saw as you entered that was looping on the screen and that's also downstairs in Laid Bare in the Landscape um, was recently acquired by the Nevada Museum of Art. So watch for that. And I'd also like to thank uh, Jessica Silverman, who's here with us, who was instrumental at her gallery and uh, Jessica Silverman Gallery in San Francisco in making that happen. So thank you. So I'm going to pass the evening back to Philip and ask Judy to come up to the stage. <laughs> okay. So I'm sorry, Judy, that I took so much time, but I had to kind of run through the whole thing. Uh, I got it. Thanks. Okay, maybe... Oh, but wait, I want to say that I, I found it really interesting because, uh, first of all, a lot of people don't know this aspect of my work, you know, my body of work, as I was saying to you, is just beginning to emerge from the shadow of the dinner party. And um, I, as much as I was glad for all the attention, it did block out all of my work. And I remember when you were doing this show and you discovered my fireworks pieces and included them. And so I was really interested to see you place it. It was the first time, other than the catalog, that I've heard you speak about you know, that whole, and I, I think it's great that you've expanded the discourse about what constitutes land art. Well, thank you. So it was also, Judy asked me a while ago for a catalog um, to write a piece about, an essay about the early atmospheres. And you know, when we were doing the show, we did a lot of research, but I didn't dig that deep. So I thought, let's go through the archives. I was very thrilled to write about the atmospheres, and I think it's coming out in September. Yeah, it's a monograph, major monograph. OK. And um, yeah, so I was digging deep, and I was reading all this early work, you know, all this early text about the early work of the late 60s through 74. And um, yeah, maybe that's how we should start, because I was like looking at all these texts, and there's this famous interview, or there's an interview in Art Forum with Lucy Lepart. 1974. 1974, and they talk about atmospheres, they talk about your minimalist earlier work, uh, about many things. And then I thought, oh, let's look up Lucy Lepart. You know, she published this famous book, I don't know if you know that, Six Years of Dematerialization, where she included from the late 60s to 1972, I think, all the dematerialized artworks. You know, artists that, that work like in more in a conceptual manner, but she also includes, you know, so she includes like conceptual artists, she includes land artists, and I said, oh, let's look up what she put in there about Judy. And they've known each other, that's what I found out in 1965. And the surprising thing, it's kind of like the Bible of conceptual art. So I looked it up, is Judy in there? Is feminist discourse in there? Did it make it? Mm. And your pieces weren't in there. And I was really surprised that she would do an interview and you guys have known each other, and uh, that she wouldn't include it while Michael Heiser's double negative, for example, is in there, which I think is much more sculptural than, it. of course, it also talks about absence. and and all that, but um, I was surprised about that. Yeah, well, I remember when you were working on the essay and you called me up and you said, I can't find any writing on this work. And I said, Philip, that's because there hasn't been any and your essay really is the first essay to be published about yeah. this work. I, I mean, I was really, it, it, it was, uh, it's thrilling for me that the body of my work is starting to be, is starting to emerge. Mm -hmm. And this whole period and the fireworks pieces and ephemeral pieces, not only, I, I think part of it has to do with the environment, particularly of the 60s. Like, I was, I, there was just this show in Nice at Villa Arsan about 
the, uh, the 60s in LA, and the curator, Geraldine Gourbet, who I know you met and are now engaged with, she was obsessed with one of my works from the 60s called The Feather Room, which also had to do with dematerialization. And she asked me this question. I recreated, reimagined The Feather Room for her show, and I'm going to do it again for Jeffrey Deitch's show in September in L.A. that looks at my early work. But she said to me, did Doug Wheeler ever see The Feather Room? And it completely disconcerted me. And I realized that it was because, well, I have no idea. I mean, he's younger than me. It was 1967. And I realized that in the 60s, it would have been inconceivable for anybody to pose the question, did a woman artist's work influence a male artist? <laughs> inconceivable. And, and you know, and it's it's interesting that you're saying that because it's not that Judy's Judy's work has wasn't shown at the time and she was in '66. There was the famous at the Jewish Museum in New York, uh, the primary structures exhibition, you know, that introduced minimalism to a broader audience. You were in the Los Angeles American Sculptures of the '60s exhibition. You had a show in '69 at the Pasadena Museum of Art, which was the place at the moment, you know. At, at, and I know, did a 60s. fireworks piece. You there. did a fireworks piece there, so you were very present. But I also remember what Walter Hobbs, the famous curator, maybe you want to talk about that in the. In oh, how he refused to look at Rainbow Pickett. You know, actually, in this bizarre way, I've been thinking a lot about... Walter Hobbs was the most important curator in Southern California in the 1960s. I was living and working in Pasadena in a studio. There were a lot of male artists around, including Bruce Nauman, who was around the corner. And Walter used to visit everybody's studios like once a month in Pasadena because he was at the Pasadena Museum. And I had just finished Rainbow Picket, and Walter literally refused to look at it when he came to visit, like refused. And then some years later, I had, he was in Washington, I had breakfast with him, and he said to me, but you have to understand, Judy, in the 1960s, women artists were either groupies or artists' wives. So what was I supposed to do with the fact that you were making art that was stronger than the men's. It was like looking at a woman who pulled up her skirt and rolled down her stockings. I had to avert my eyes. And of course, he expected me to like say, oh, Walter, that's all right, I understand. But anyway, <laughs> but I realized that in some bizarre way, what Walter said describes what the art world has tried to do with my work for a very long time. That's why Alex's calling the Miami ICA show a reckoning was really sort of uh, meaningful because what he was saying is, okay, we can't do that anymore. We really have to reckon with five decades of significant practice, right? And so, I, you know, I think that your show, Ends of the Earth, where you place my f uh, early fireworks pieces into the context, I mean, that was very radical to do that. It was the first time anybody thought like that or saw that. But that comes from a younger generation's perspective, thank God, you know? I mean, I no, really, I put my faith in art history, and, you know, that's what's happened. Art history has, in fact, come around. Okay, I know you have questions, so go ahead. No, 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 but it was, <laughs> I think it was a great start. But, um, yeah, where should we start? Let's just start in the very beginning. So Pasadena at that time was like the, the place to be. And um, let, let me just show the first one. That's from 1967, an early piece. But That's dry ice, right. Exactly. But I want to talk about, before we talk about dry ice, and uh, you collaborated also with your then husband, uh, Lloyd Hamrall, yeah. on dry ice pieces. The feather room. Exactly. Yeah. But how did everything start before you... Or what was there? What started atmospheres? You were fa you were known as a minimalist sculptor. You know who made the rainbow picket? It's like it looks like a minimalist sculpture that's leaning against the except wall. Except for the colors. Except for the colors, they were completely no go for yeah right for him and for, for Walter Hobbs. Yeah, um, 
You know, uh, uh, because you've been thinking about the, this aspect of my work and focusing on it, of course, has made me think back about a number of things, like the fact that in, 19, I think it was 1965, I think it was I, I think it was sixty five. You can check it if you want as a good art historian. Richard Serra had a, a show at the Pasadena Museum, and he piled a bunch of redwoods, and in the gallery, and you know redwoods were endangered. I, it really upset me. The piece really upset me. Its arrogance upset me, and I got into a really big fight with him about it. Did I ever tell you this? No, you never did. <laughs> and uh, the next morning, I, I had a loft up, upstairs in Pasadena in, in a kind of inconceivable situation now, which was three of us artists shared 5,000 square feet. We paid a total of $75 a month rent. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, you could live on nothing in those days. You didn't have to have a full-time job. I mean, I remember Billy L. Bankston told me when I said, because he had a, I, I visited his studio. He was a very prominent L.A. artist in the 60s. You know, I said, well, you know, do you have a job? And he said, being an artist is my full-time job. And that was it for me. I'm like, right. <laughs> so um, anyway, the next morning, there was this pounding at my front door, and I went downstairs, and there was Richard Serra with art for him in his hand, and he said, you might not like it, but they do. Oh, wow. You never told me that story. But it, <laughs> it defined the era, because you were right. All the support was going to the guys. And I don't know if that informed my decision. To, I remember why I decided to start working in colored smokes. I did this collaborative, I was always interested in collaboration. I organized these artists' events in Brookside Park. But before that, I, I worked with other p artists on this environment. Our studio fronted the uh, Colorado Boulevard where the Rose Bowl parade went. And we decided to do an event on New Year's Eve for all the people who were like, lining the streets. It was called the Raymond Rose Ritual Environment. We stretched like screens across the buildings and projected things. And I lined the street with fog machines. And I designed this, we had Klieg lights and I designed, because I was working on color systems then, I designed this spectrum color wheel and the Klieg light was picking up the smoke as it rose and turning it in all these colors because of the spectral wheel. And I looked up at this and I thought, I'm going to do colored smoke. Now I look back and think about the domes and the enclosed and you talk color. About the, the domes? Yeah, these, I was doing these blown domes and plastics and spraying them at different levels using these color systems, which I then actually applied to my fireworks pieces too. And now, I mean, this was in the lead up period to my making this radical break in my art practice and going off to create a feminist, to figure out how to create a feminist art practice and feminist art education. And now I see this as like a gesture of liberation where my color was coming out of the formal structures out I had been using, also. out of the domes, out of the paintings and filling the space. But I also think it had, coming back to the Richard Serra story, I think it had to do with my horror at this dominating impulse and my wanting to um, find another kind of way to interact with the land. And this was the first piece in Brookside Park. 68. Yeah, 68. Yes. Actually, that's Susan Teitelman. I went to school with her. She's married to Ry Cooter. <laughs> um, but I, you know, from the fog machines I gra I mean, on the ground. That's right I, next to the Rose Bowl, for those of you who know LA. It's like yeah. a park right next to it. Right. I mean, I graduated to these smoke guns. And of course, you know, this is the a middle of the anti-war movement. You know, I mean, now I also see like immolation too with the 
uh, the one you showed of the uh, of faith in in this orange smoke. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, the, the monks gas. were burning themselves. Remember, you know, you were too young to know no, this. I, yeah. So, <laughs> okay, go on, Philip. So these well, were the first pieces. Well, but I think that's Brookside is important because as you organized this festival together with Sam Francis and right, James and Terrell. Right, Jim Terrell, right. And I think it's really interesting, you know, to go back and to see, well, the feminist discourse at that time wasn't that segregated. I mean, if you collaborated with them... There was no feminist discourse then, Jim. I mean, I mean, yeah. Philippe. No, I mean, there wasn't. It was just starting. It just started at the end of the 60s. The early women's liberation literature oh. was coming out of New York. It was re this was really, really before that. There, there was no conversation about gender. There was no conversation about sexism. Couldn't. Yeah. And how did you, you know, at that time, point in time, there was this big uh, light and space movement going on, especially in California. How did your, your projects relate to that? Or how did you, did people or friends, if it wasn't like Art Forum, did friends situate your, your early atmosphere No, pieces? in fact, actually, I mean, it was, like when I did the Pasadena Museum piece, I mean, that was a pretty that big... That comes later. Yeah, yeah. but... Uh, Oh, this was also Brookside Park. So first I did single color. And of course, this was a time when, you know, there were no regulations. My <laughs> friends and I could just go yeah. to the park, you know, and, and it was always a collaboration because I needed people. Some people lit flares. Some people took pictures. Some people brought food when we started traveling around. I mean, we did them in parks. We did them on the beach. We did them in the national forest. Can you imagine that? I know, and it's really complicated because we were planning to do a, a, a atmosphere piece in Miami, and it was so. <laughs> you're doing one now, finally. But the but logistics so, are the logistics unbelievable. The logistics are very complicated, and the regulation and permits and and everything. <sighs> This is Santa Barbara Museum. I really like that. Yeah, I like that. I like setting the museum on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so how did the Santa Barbara Museum happen? Was it a commission? I, yeah, yeah. They asked, invited me, of course, because, I mean, there was stains left on the front of the museum. And, and it, but they incorporated that. They went around and they said, and this is where Judy's piece was. <laughs> and, okay, this is the desert, of course. This is Palm Desert. And by this time, I was starting this. Then I started, uh, once I started the Feminist Art Program in Fresno, I started bringing my students with me. And mm -hmm. uh, that was when I started the Women in Smoke, where I painted mm -hmm. the um, women's bodies to match the colors of the smoke. This they is come later, that. but I think that's, that's interesting that a lot of the atmosphere pieces happen either in Fresno or then when you went to CalArts and brought the feminist art program to CalArts yeah. in 71. Yeah, 71. Yeah. So, okay, so let's continue. Um, this that's, is on the beach of Sa uh, in Santa Barbara. Did that happen at the same time when the museum... Uh, no, uh -uh. this was another one of those where we just went out on the beach and lit flares. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think this is an amazing, I think it's really interesting that the pieces go, I mean, there's also over the six years that you made these atmospheres and then it was also, we can talk about that later, why you stopped doing them and now you started not, to recreate. Not willingly, I didn't stop willingly. Yeah, maybe, yeah. well, we, no, we, we we'll don't want to, yeah. exactly, we'll get there. But I feel it's really interesting. In the beginning, it feels how you described it with the domes and the gestures of liberation. It feels like it is about expanded painting practice because you were experimenting with the Pasadena Lifesavers, the work on paper, with color systems. Yeah, right. And, and when we get, if we get to the Pasadena Lifesavers, I mean, the Pasadena Museum piece, which is, no, no, this, this was the ones I did going up the Northwest Coast on a trip. And yeah. it was only later that I realized I put smoke in every hole and crevice I found. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a really interesting piece, and I think in the PowerPoint. Yeah, oh. this is a, I eventually collected them in a series and talked about this trip up the Northwest, up the uh, coast of California, up into Canada, and placing uh, smoke along the way. 
but it was like a private. Yeah, it was, was totally kind of like a private, private performance. Totally private. Took a picture, right. and the diary, the text is really nice. I mean, you talk about feminizing the landscape on one hand, but you also talk about many other things in there. I think there is this. Uh, it's it's a wonderful work. It's a wonderful piece. Yeah, well, see the you know here you can see my already interest in uh, the in trying to have the female experience become a pathway to the universal. So if you read of this, a beam of light hit the smoke, and it looked like the proverbial description of heaven, the apocalypse, and a supernova all rolled into one. I mean, you know, we're talking about a world in which the masculine has mm -hmm. been the pathway to the universal, and male art is what is considered the art of humankind. So I'm already starting to think about how to disrupt that and make a place for the female experience and to understand that it can illuminate the world for us or the landscape for us in a different way. That's interesting, I think, because I always felt the atmosphere pieces are like the hinge between the early work, you know, where you try to establish like a new language. And you also said, you know, maybe you can also talk about that. I think you said you don't want to, you don't want that the artworks look like they were made by men. You right. want to do artworks that are made by a woman. Maybe you can talk a little bit about well, that. Well, I mean, the biggest oh. thing, the biggest compliment you could get as a woman artist in the 60s was that your work looked like it was done by a man. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's inconceivable now. But mm -hmm. then that was, it was the opposite. It was like when Irving Blum, who ran Ferris Gallery, which was the most important gallery in Southern California, mm -hmm. visited me in Pasadena and saw my domes. You know, here I am trying mm -hmm. to rid my work of gender associations. At the same time, I keep coming back. My real impulses keep coming back, as you saw in that writing. Mm -hmm. And when Irving saw the domes, he said, ah, the Venus of Willendorf, which was the kiss of death in 1968. And do you think, so how was the color, like the decision to make the piece that we were talking about, this, the rainbow spigot, for example, but also these pieces, some of them are extremely toxic, you know. Mm, it, the smoke wasn't toxic. No, but, uh, oh. but they kind of look like this. Oh, yeah, sure. It so looked like, how, a, a, but this is before terrorist attacks, you have to realize. Yeah, yeah. I mean, now we can look at them. In fact, if you look at the one with the bridge, you have that? Yeah. That yeah. Case. Oh, this is in a construction site. This was at Fresno. This is Pasadena Museum, now the Norton Simon. And actually, there were a whole ser a bunch of young male artists who did this piece with me. Laddie and Guy Dill, Chuck Arnaldi, Tom Woodle, oh, they really? all were working with me. They were just out of Chenard. You don't know who they are, but Philippe does. But anyway, but y you were asking me, I mean, I got into a huge fight with John Copeland, who was running the museum. You should have seen how they promoted this piece. They did not promote it as a serious work of art. They promoted it as Judy's carnivalesque performances. It was the gala piece. It was yeah, it was the gala. a gala piece. I mean, and the whole writing about it was completely different than, for example, how the Richard Serra had been written about as serious mm. art. You know, the, what, not did they, what did they say? I don't remember it. I just know it got me furious because it was just in all this language, like it was yeah. carnival-like. It wasn't a serious work. But the way I laid out the smokes was exactly the way I laid out the colors in Pasadena Lifesavers or all those color studies. So when the, uh, what I was looking at is the way this color would then mingle in the air, mm -hmm. okay, on a canvas it would dissolve in front of your eyes. The mm -hmm. color would make the form dissolve. Well, here the mm -hmm. color caused the atmosphere mm -hmm. to dissolve in a, an array of color. Why did you pick the title? You know, I have never talked about this before. No, but it's interesting. No, and I never asked you questions like that. So. No, no <laughs> because no, there's been no serious study of this work yeah. until you, Philip. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks. 
I think these works are amazing, and it's also interesting that I think what's really interesting is that the institution commissioned your work, but then they would talk shit about it. Right. You know, to, to, right. I mean, pardon my French, but I think Santa Barbara Museum, the Pasadena Museum of Art, John Copland's, who was with Art Forum, I mean, he was known. He, they wouldn't write in Art Forum, but they would hire you or ask you to well, do he, that. Well, John did write about me, but he was always conflicted. You know, he used to say, you can't be a woman and an artist, too. Wow. But you had the show in Pasadena that, that was, was the year John. before. Yeah, that was John. Right. That yeah, was because they, when Irving wouldn't show the domes, John did. I mean, yeah. he had sent Irving to see them. But I think what's really interesting also about the pieces, how they interact with the male-dominated architecture. You know, they don't soften the landscape in this case. No, I'm trying to disappear that damn museum. <laughs> <laughs> or, the, or, or, the, or the construction site. Yeah, but here, yeah, for example, here. Yeah. it kind of makes it disappear. Yeah, totally. Yeah, well, this was part one. And, and again, you know, it's really important to stress how important uh, support is mm -hmm. and how, you know, you can't achieve as an artist without support. I mean, John did support me, but it was always ambiguous and conflicted. And, you mm -hmm. know, wh whereas the three atmospheres I did at F Cal State Fullerton were commissioned by Dextra Frankel, the I curator the there who did this huge... Pas that's Pasadena? Yeah, that's Pasadena. Okay, this was an, uh, another one at, at, in Fuller. You did three in Fuller. I did so Fuller. Uh, this one. And there's the bridge. That's and the bridge, two. right. I hope we have the bridge. Yes. Now, this, 1971. Can you imagine being able to do that now? Did you have to, per was that permitted or it was just? Permit? <laughs> <laughs> No, I know, that's what I thought. <laughs> no, but it, it's, it's interesting. It has this, and I think you talk about that, you know, when you made the private fire pieces on the way to Vancouver, you talk about this guerrilla uh, strategy, you know, you just throw like, a, like dynamite in there and then you, you hide. I just want, but at that point, this is the end of the 60s. You know, I've now had a 10-year struggle in the male-dominated art scene, which I just wanted to dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> but like here in Fullerton it's interesting because these all look like buildings that were recently built and I know that the they project were then. the project you did with, with um, your then husband uh, Lloyd Hamrell yeah. that was in where, oh in Century City Century City right how much was this like a, because many of these land art artists and that's what I was mentioning before, you know, they dealt with urbanism, sprawl, all the freeways that were built in the 60s. I mean, for example, Michael Heiser always talks about that he uses the desert as a blank canvas to make his cut. And I think, you know what, but if you look there, you know, if you look at the work and you see how close it is for, from the Hoover Dam, from the freeway that makes this cut in the landscape, it relates to all this. So my question is, how much does this relate, or is this also kind of a critique of urbanism, or was it was it both a critique of urbanism and um, a critique of masculinity, masculinity and st structures that are being erected by men? Well, the Century City uh, dry ice pieces. There were two of them. Um, mm -hmm. Century City was new then; Ve it was just being built. And so you have to understand, L.A. was going through this massive urbanization. I mean, when I got there, and it, there were still orange groves and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, eucalyptus mm -hmm. groves at UCLA. And now the freeways are coming, you know, it's the end of the 50s into the 60s. L.A. is being concreted over. And at Century City, they wanted to highlight the development. So there was this art and technology group that I was involved with. And they invited us all to do pieces there. Well, I'm watching the uh, commercialization of the mall go up and then yeah. plant dry ice and disappear it before it can like <laughs> take over. <laughs> if only for a moment. I mean, but it took 40 years for that work to be understood. It was not understood, the dry ice work until I worked with Jenna Didier and mm -hmm. that, uh, I forget what they were called for Pacific Standard Time, to pick up where I'd left mm -hmm. off in fireworks and dry ice. And Jenna, it was an architectural group, and Jenna mm -hmm. said, Judy, you are critiquing monumentality in architecture. Absolutely. 
And that was the first time anybody, 40 years it took. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know if you know about the Pacific Standard Time project that the Getty initiated. There was one about Southern California in 2012 and 2013, I think both years, and they initiated a lot of exhibitions in institutions across the city, and a lot of this history, you know, uh, would be visible again. And, and they also, in Pomona, for example, uh, Judy, who had a show there in, with Hal Glicksman, when was that, 69 also? 70? I was the only woman to show in that oh, well. whole period in Pomona. Did you know that? That's crazy. When, what's her name? Helene Wiener was there. She never showed one woman. Interesting. That yeah, was the 60s. But you recreated the piece for, for Mount Baldy for... Um, no, re- no. They, they actually uh, did photographs from the Mount photograph. Baldy piece and then commissioned me to do... To pick well, what happened with Pacific Standard Time is that I had the opportunity. A lot of my male colleagues, like Mark Susuvro, recreated pieces they had done, but I didn't. I picked up where I'd left off okay. in 1974, yeah. which was great. But but I know it was the Pacific Standard Time project that gave visibility to the right. ice architecture, and it's in, interesting for those of you who know the Southern California history at the Pasadena Museum of Art. There was also Alan Capro right. in 1967 who did all these ice houses. It was called Fluid, Fluids. It was all over the city, and it's interesting also how your piece. Re- I haven't looked at the exact date, but it kind of responds to that. His his are melting, and then you ended up with Alan. At CalArts. Yes, I actually, later. yeah, I actually like Ellen. Of course, he was a big influence on Suzanne Lacey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was my, I say, the student, the one of the Fresno girls, totally politically incorrect. They said to me, "Girl, I, when I see them, they're in their fifties and sixties, and they go, Judy, we're not girls.'" I'm, mean, yeah, but you always <laughs> be girls to me. I mean, you know, they were nineteen and twenty when I, they worked with me. So anyway, okay, Fullerton. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. This is Irvine, actually. It's, no, maybe it is in it's Fullerton or Irvine. Anyway, somewhere down there in Orange County. So what were the reactions? I, I actually don't think there were any. The, like, I, my whole show, the entire, that show at Cal State Fullerton was all 15 Pasadena Lifesavers, domes, and atmosphere photos, mm-hmm. and there was nothing happened. I mean, that was my experience in the 60s. I had, in 71 or 2, I had a show of the Fresno fans and the Flesh Gardens at mm-hmm. Jack Glenn's. Nothing happened. No responses, no writing, no uh, sales, no nothing. It's one of the reasons I ended up having to destroy a lot of those sculptures. That's what's so thrilling to me, to ha- be having this fall at Jeffrey Dyke's L.A. Gallery 12,000 square foot gallery in, in LA, a show of my early work in which we're bringing back a mm-hmm. lot of the pieces that I had to destroy. It's just thrilling to me. No, and I think this is really great what you said before about the, the big shadow of the dinner party in the late 70s that people don't look back. And I think when you look at this work and you contextualize it, what was going on at the same time, I think it's it's amazing. But you also, at that time, I mean, you were a huge influence as an educator at CalArts. Well, I only, I, I mean, I didn't start teaching, actually, until I went to Fresno mm-hmm. to figure out how to create a feminist art practice and feminist art education. Uh, but, I, you know, I didn't teach yeah. that much. I only taught, like, three years. Two years at CalArts and one year at the Women's Building. Yeah. And by then, I was, like... I was ready to, during which time I was apprenticing myself in China painting, doing all this research and getting ready to do the dinner party, and then I disappeared in my studio. Yeah, but let's maybe talk about the ones, you know, where you worked with students. With my students, right. This is, uh, but, I mean, you know, when you were talking about, like, uh, other people working around the world with different intentions, Mm -hmm. political intentions, I particularly found it interesting about Hiroshima and Mm -hmm. and Japan, and and I thought that was... Israel. Israel, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, people don't... It's interesting how... uh, much people are drawn to this image. It's been included in multiple exhibitions and books. And of course, at the time, people you know now don't realize about the monks burning themselves in relation to the Vietnam War, 
I, I was also doing research on women and the treatment of women and sati in yeah, India. Yeah, talk about that. There's this piece that's called immolation. Yeah. I don't think we have a picture of that. That's this. That's oh, immolation. That's, sorry, oh, that's, yeah. yeah, that's immolation. This is immolation. Maybe, yeah, maybe you should talk about immolation and... Uh, well, I mean, it, you know, a lot know. of people associated with the monks uh, who are burning themselves, but for me it was more about sati, the practice that used to be said of widows throwing themselves in the fire when their husbands died in mm -hmm. India, but now we know they were pushed by the in-laws. Did you know that? Mm. No. Anyway, so, but I, but for these, I was, I painted, I was talking about this, I painted Faith's body green, and I, I was sick yesterday, since I've started doing fireworks pieces, yesterday, I, I think I told you this. Yesterday, Donald and I were in LAX, in the airport lounge. I was on WhatsApp communicating with a photo group and my artist liaison from my New York gallery in Miami who, are, who did a series of images based on my smoke pieces for Harper's Bazaar the next issue of Harper's Bazaar. And I was directing them via WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually great that you're picking up the atmospheres again after. Yeah. Um, well, I started, like you said, in 2012. And I've done, yeah. like, a uh, purple poem for Miami next month will be the sixth major piece. And yeah. they're at much bigger scale. The thing is, is that one of the reasons I stopped in 1974, which I know we're going to get to, is because I couldn't get support for getting bigger in scale. And since mm -hmm. uh, Pacific Standard Time Performance Festival, I mean, I've really had the opportunity mm -hmm. to work at, at a much bigger scale. And I really enjoyed doing A Butterfly for Pomona because it was on a football field. My butterfly yeah. alighted we'll come to on that a, in football, a second. football But it's football interesting field. to see that over the, short, over the six years that you were doing the atmosphere pieces yeah. in the beginning, they were monochromatic, and then they were totally toxic. Some, some, you know, the Santa Barbara one was the purple. And then they get more narrative, yeah. more symbolic, more like tied to rituals also. And I think it's interesting when you... Re in goddess imagery, which, in, I was, exactly. which I was investigating in the early 70s, which so, some of these images come out of. How did that happen? I mean, well, uh, I was doing all this research in women's history. And so I discovered that all... Uh, early civilizations worshipped goddesses. And so I did these series of images that, you know, had women creating fire. I mean, I was beginning to develop the narrative that would begin become the basis of mm -hmm. the dinner party, and you know, reconceiving mm -hmm. the history of Western civilization in terms of women's contributions. And the it, it, that was definitely the women and the women and smoke images come out of that female empowerment, mm -hmm. merger of flesh and landscape, mm -hmm. uh, nature. You know, I know it's essentialist. Oh, there's a new term called strategic essentialism. Oh, you have to describe that. Okay, strategic essentialism, which is really what I practiced. I mean. You know, I don't really think there's all that many differences between men and women, except for the fact that women give birth. And, uh, but, you know, then I got branded an essentialist, that I was degrading women with my images, blah, 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 blah. But now essentialism yeah. has come back in the form of strategic <laughs> essentialists. I'm like, great, I'm a strategic essentialist. <laughs> I like that. That's <laughs> that amazing. Um, but the new one, you just showed me the pictures. You were talking about WhatsApp, but the ladies yeah. in there, they have cost, they have they, dresses, Yeah, because right? you can't have nipples in, in Harper's Bazaar. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Even though it's an all-female <laughs> readership, right? And they don't know they have nipples. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Judy, let's talk. I mean, one aspect about land arts that's really, I think, important is media. You know, and so the question is, who took the photographs? Who filmed right. the performance? I mean, can I call them? This is like a struggle I've had because I know you're reluctant to call certain pieces performances. Do you consider them performances or do you call them pieces? Well, the I, atmospheres? I, I, 
I think, I think I always called them pieces. I mean, first of all, there wasn't that much, you know, performance art. I mean, like, you know, it was born, really, especially yeah. feminist performance. I was born <laughs> in the 70s. So, I mean, people weren't going around yeah. talking about, you know, that's a new thing, performance art genre. I mean, that's yeah. all, you know, then. I, and also, I translated them because I would never was interested in totally ephemeral work. I mean, I try. I did pieces, but they had to be translated into images, like in Northwest Coast atmospheres. You know where I mounted mm -hmm. them. I added text. I made them into objects mm -hmm. because, and you know, now these are all recorded as photos, and they you know made prints. We're going to make a print for Purple Poem from, from mm -hmm. Miami, you know, so because otherwise there's no record of them. But you bro did you bring a photo photographer? Oh, yeah, yeah, or, everybody. Or who, you know, part of my team, everybody had a came. job, and some people took pictures. From the class. And, and how, did you, class find these from the how did you find the locations? Did you just take, like, a car and you all went out there? No, I mean, I knew, I mean, I knew California. I'd been living in California since 1957. Yeah, so I knew the desert. So very, very beaches. specific about the locations. Yeah, you yeah, picked, very, you knew very where specific. Going. Yeah, yeah, we're going to the beach. We're going to the desert. We're going to the national forest. We're going to Brookside Park. I mean, the sites were part of it. The site-specific mm -hmm. nature of the piece. They've always mm -hmm. been site-specific. I was telling you, Purple Poem from Miami, mm -hmm. they moved it from the Garden of, I mm -hmm. of Miami ICA to That's the state the upcoming plaza, one in right, yeah. you know, which required reconceptualizing it for the a larger public mm -hmm. plaza. No, I don't. Let's just see. Um, this one, when I see these pictures, it also reminds me of Zabriskie Point, Antonioni. There's oh, this scene, you know, where they, like the couples on this hill, and I always thought... It's a kind of surreal, I think. Totally what, surreal. Yeah. And I felt, did you ever think about that? No, I didn't, actually. I, no, okay. I, I, I didn't. I that's didn't. why I didn't put it in my essay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you, that's what you get to do. <laughs> I know. It was the, I mean, I was really interested in the thing with the color and the landscape and how, you know, and this is these are actually the images Harper's Bazaar looked at before they staged the pieces on Miami Beach yesterday. Did they you give them like ins ins instructions what they how they have to move in space? Yeah, actually, that was very interesting. In fact, Donald took a series of photos of me in the airport lounge because they they wanted to have dancers, which I thought was a really good idea, and they wanted diverse body types because you know, I, and also diverse uh, like not just Caucasian thin perfect models, mm -hmm. you know, and and it, but. The dancers got overly enthusiastic, and you know they were like dancing. I didn't want them to dance. I wanted yeah. them to like pose. And actually, this is a hysterical picture, a series of pictures Donald took of me going, no, like <laughs> here, here, slow down, slow motion. Mm -hmm. I never got that. I mean, also it was hard for the photographer when they were you know, dancing around. I said, it's like he's got to be able to take pictures of you in particular postures. Yeah. I had, I wanted, one is a kind of, is a yellow page, and it's like kind of triumphant based on like the goddess images. The other is purple, red, uh, purple, blue, and red. And the dan I wanted the dancers like emerge, the bodies emerging out of mm -hmm. the smoke. And it was really hard to get them to slow down and emerge mm -hmm. and not just dance around. But it's interesting that it's like so pictorialist and choreographed at the same yes. time, especially the later ones. Maybe let's... Yeah, see, this was... I mean, I was really inter interested. Yeah, this is the one we kind of recreated, but in a completely yellow uh, fog of smoke on the beach. And you can see it in the exhibition also. And maybe this is the butterfly, Oakland. Yeah, maybe. yeah this, was the f this was another commission piece. This was commissioned by the Oakland Museum as part of a sculpture in the city. Mm -hmm. And this was the first time I ever tried to make an actual sort of abstracted image with fireworks. And uh, what was interesting is in order to do this, we had to construct a whole, like what's called lan using lance work. It's a particular fireworks technique where you can make images with fireworks. Mm -hmm. It took like three days. And when I picked up for Pomona, 
although fireworks had changed, the technology had changed, and in fact, it was very difficult to get colored smokes. It's only recently I can get them again. But lance work hadn't changed at all. And the same kind of labor-intensive process of doing this took three days to do oh, this. Wow. And this is the last piece I was able to do. And can you talk about the butterfly, why you picked the same? Well, you know, uh, you went from like a symbolic or like a narrative symbolism in a way. Well, the butterfly is a, a, a very early symbol of the goddess. So I was very interested in goddess imagery and liberation. Liberation, you know, I'm doing these pieces of liberation with the great ladies and work, beginning to work with butterfly imagery, which became kind of the basis of the dinner party plates. So, I mean, you can, I mean, I can see the relationship of this Absolutely. to those. And this was also a transfiguration image, a kind of like, it was 17 minutes long and kind of like started, erupted, and then died. What made you end the atmosphere piece? Oh, I didn't want to end it. I wanted to go on, I wanted to get bigger. There were two things. By this time, You know, they were beginning to, to work in this scale, like in, in a city. I was beginning to have to deal with some regulations, like having, having a pyrotechnician. And I had, I had to try to, you know, I had apprenticed myself to lots of different uh, technical, you know, I went to auto body school to learn to, pre to spray paint. I had uh, apprenticed myself to the, boat builders to do 10-part cylinder, which is fiberglass. So I had a whole history of doing that, and I had apprenticed myself to a fireworks company, which was how you became a pyrotechnician, and there were no female pyrotechnicians at that point in California. And I had two challenges. I couldn't get support for going bigger than this, which I wanted to do, and I was being sexually harassed by the owner of the fireworks company. Who was the only person in Southern California at the time when you kind of needed That was it. the only path to being a pirate technician. And here's a, a fantastic story that I'm going to tell in, in Miami. When I picked up again, because of the Pacific Standard Time Performance Festival, I had to look for pyrotechnic company, because by now there's lots of regulations, mm -hmm. and as I often say, the luckiest day of my life was walking into the office of a sixth generation pyro guy at Pyro Spectaculars named Chris Souza, and yeah, he knew him. exactly, yeah, you know him from, yeah. That, yeah, right, he knew exactly who, I told him the story, and he did the Butterfly for Ramona, and he brought an all-female crew. Oh, that's amazing. I and was his worried. mother was the first female pyrotechnician in Judy, Southern I California. I was worried that he would tell me the story. You walked into the first store and the guy was still there. No, I think he's dead. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea. Well, I think we want to open the conversation for questions. I don't know, and do you want to moderate? How many of you yeah. knew about this work of mine? Uh, not many, right? Yeah. It's so thrilling to me to have people learn about it. Okay, we have Thank someone with a mic. So Claire's going to pass that around. Are there any questions? How about right here in the front row? Well, I just have to ask, here we are in the Nevada desert. Have you come or will you come to Burning Man? Only if I got commissioned. <laughs> Any other questions? How about right here? Here, let's wait for the mic so that everyone can hear. Could Thanks. you introduce yourself? I'm sorry I didn't ask you. Thank you. My name is Buzzy Vick, and I was born in Chicago also. Southside, Hyde, Hyde Park. When you had the exhibit in San Francisco at the Veterans Memorial on Van Ness. Oh, the San Francisco oh, Museum of Art. Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about the dinner party again. No, I just oh, wanted okay. to know. <laughs> did they give you a hard time anywhere exhibiting this, um, your dinner party? Anywhere. Okay, since we're talking about something that hasn't been explored in my career, and the dinner party has had like a hundred books written about it, including one 
by a historian named Jane Gearhart called Judy Chicago's Dinner Party, The Power of Popular Feminism, in which she chronicles exactly what happened with the dinner party. So I recommend, if you want to know, you read it, because it's a great read and a great story about how art fueled a worldwide exhibition tour supported by grassroots group all, groups all over the world. It's an inspiring story about the power of art. I think it's me right here. Yeah. Um, hi. Who are you? Uh, my name is Kelsey. Uh, what do you do? <laughs> um, I am a community education coordinator for a parks department. <laughs> and I also love art um, and your work. <laughs> so thanks. Um, I was curious. Uh, I've recently learned about this work, and it's amazing. Um, have you put yourself in the smoke? Have you done any self-portraits with that? And if not, why not? It's very difficult to ignite flares, direct <laughs> the people doing it, and be in it at the same time. No, can't. Impossible. Not possible. Claire, back here in the center aisle. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was in the oh, smoke Rossi. in the first piece with the smoke guns. Hi, my name is Rosita Todorova, and I'm an artist. And I just want your advice as an educator, as an artist that we have all admired for you know, the majority of our lives. Um, for a young woman, or any artist, that is looking to continue to w do work that's about the desert, that's about the monumental, um, that's about the feminine, Like, what advice do you have, and how um, how do we kind of combat the masculinity of it? Uh, and so, you know, it's just, it's, it's something that, you know, you want to create the monumental, but there's always the dismissal of the, the masculine in it. And it's a, it's a struggle, and I want your advice. It's funny. Today we posted a clip from an interview I did uh, as part of the Miami ICA show in which uh, I... I I'm often asked about advice. I'm often asked to give advice. And I um, think it's a little presumptuous because everybody has their own challenges. But in this clip, I did speak to young artists. It's on my Instagram. So maybe you just want to go listen to it. It got like, I guess it must have touched a nerve because it got like, 2,500 hits in two hours. So maybe it'll be relevant to you, too. What, oh, Judy yeah. Dot Chicago. That's my husband, wonderful yeah. photographer, Donald Woodman. Yeah, Judy Dot Chicago, although it's easy to find Instagram. And the other thing about Instagram that I love is seeing all these young women's sites like Vagina China, Club Clitoris, Big Red Clit. I just love it. Let's take two more questions. Claire in the back. Hi. <laughs> oh. um, my name is Jamie Loyola. I'm Where actually are you? A, I'm right here. Oh, I might okay. be behind this pillar. Oh, okay. What's your name? <laughs> Jamie Loyola. <clears throat> I'm Hi. actually a, I'm an engineer. Um, this is fairly new to me. I've got a question with two follow-ups, if that's cool. <laughs> Nevada's a big desert. You're here now. Um, the work I've seen so far was all based out of California. Would you consider, like, irrespective of Burning Man, coming here as a platform for your work? Well, the only way I can do fireworks pieces now, like I said, is, is com commissions, because they've gotten much, much more complicated. You know, I, I used to be able to do fireworks pieces for less than $500. Okay. And now it's more like fifty to a hundred thousand dollars because closer of to regulations, huh? Closer to a hundred. Closer to a hundred. <laughs> yeah, all right. Philip Philip tried to do one in Miami. I mean, you know, it takes a crew of pyrotechnicians. It takes like permits. It's a much much more complicated process. And yes, I'm open to doing pieces wherever I can. I mean, I've done some pieces like. Uh, in our backyard, <laughs> in New Mexico, yes. 
uh, which I, we really enjoyed because we just went out there and lit flares. <laughs> when, when was that recently? Yeah, yeah, last couple of years. I was actually thinking, Don and I were actually thinking about, I just haven't had time, maybe going, because New Mexico is still a little more like L.A. used to be. I mean, you can do things. With, in fact, w we were doing a test for a piece, and Chris Souza came, and we did not have to get any permits. In fact, the fire department just sat there watching us. <laughs> And he's like, I'm moving to New Mexico. <laughs> so on the subject of permitting, do you think flouting the law or flouting permitting processes would actually hinder your recognition? It has nothing to do with recognition. I'm going to tell you a story about that that had to do with, because it, when the Pacific Performance, uh, Standard Time Performance Festival happened in LA, and they brought a lot of artists of my generation to LA to do pieces, everybody encountered the regulations, including a sculptor named Mark de Suvero. I don't know if you know who that is. In the 60s, he did this huge peace tower as a protest against the Vietnam War, which I worked on. I ran the jackhammer. But anyway, uh, they wanted Mark to recreate a section of the peace tower. And the, cu the curator of Pacific Standard Time Performance Festival, Glenn Phillips, was terrified that he was going to have to bail Mark out of jail because Mark was fuming in his hotel room that he couldn't go out and just do the piece like he did in the 70s. And at one point he said, fuck it, I'm just going to go crane that fucker up. And Glenn's go, oh, oh my God, he's going to have to bail him out of jail. It has nothing to do with recognition. It has to do with the laws. <laughs> I think that's enough, right? Okay. I think we'll wrap it up there. Philippe and Judy, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.